What's up, Navigating Academia family? I hope you guys are having a fantastic day so far. Guys, over the last several months, it has been such a joy for me to be able to work one-on-one -on -one with so many of you guys who are going to be applying for master's and doctoral programs for next year. Now, one of the big things that I do for you guys is to be able to give an independent review of your personal statements. And I have seen some amazing personal statements, and I have also seen some ones that are a little bit problematic, right? But one thing is always, always the case which is regardless of how perfect it is or how much work it needs, that independent eye is absolutely critical. You can show it to supervisors, you can show it to parents, family members, people at career centers, but you need somebody who's kind of on the inside to be able to take a look at it and provide you with feedback. And so that's what I do for y'all, as you know, and you can book a session with me down here via the website below for me to take a look at your personal statement, diversity statement, any supplemental essays you have to write, your CV, and so forth. Come up with a letter of recommendation plan, you name it. Anyway, when it comes to taking a look at personal statements, though, uh, I would say that I have identified kind of five big mistakes, the five biggest mistakes that I usually see in the personal statements for particularly master's and doctoral programs in behavioral health. So these are things like doctorates in clinical psychology, either PhDs or PsyDs. Also, things like social work, counseling, and so forth. And so because of that, I figured that I would make you guys this video today to be able to try to help you guys out, okay? So my notes are down here, so if you have the opportunity to be able to see me look down a little bit, that's the reason why, okay? So let's go ahead and go through each of these one at a time and pretty briefly. So number one is jumping right into the deep end. This means that in paragraph one, literally almost like sentence one, you just jump right into, I want to be a clinical psychologist because blah, 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 blah. It's just jumping right into it, okay? Uh, the only part of a personal statement which should be similar to an undergraduate personal statement, right, so a one for grad school versus undergrad, is that you need some kind of a hook. Trust me on this one, grad school supervisors, we are reading freaking hundreds of these things sometimes. This past year, a very dear friend of mine up at a university, big name university in Pennsylvania, told me that each one of the different supervisors in his grad department who's accepting students has gotten over 120 applications. So already your chances of getting a spot are a fraction of 1%. But it's one of these things where when that's the case, your personal statement, which provides the narrative version of your career to date and also gives you the opportunity to persuade the target supervisor or the admissions committee that they should have you be the one who they're offering a spot. It's really, really important that this thing be freaking amazing, okay? It's really important. It's going to help you stand out so much. Remember, test scores and GPA, those things are just going to get you past that initial screening stage. After that, it's all of the additional materials which are important, and your personal statement gives you the opportunity also, in case any of your other materials are either non-existent or they're a little bit weak, maybe you had a lower GPA undergrad, but you made up for it in a master's degree, and now you're really worried about what's going to happen that you had maybe one really bad semester or one really bad year, but there was a reason why. Where do you put that? How do you describe it? This is where the personal statement comes in, okay? That's where it can play a really critical role, all right? So if in paragraph one, though, instead of having some kind of a hook, which really, you know, pulls the reader in, uh, and then if it's something where when you're kind of taking a look at the rest of the paragraph, it literally is just talking about, I want to be a clinician, I want to do this, and I want to do that. It's too much. It's almost like a shotgun, right? It is just immediate, right there, in your face. You need to think about... Daria and I were in the Dominican Republic, right, a few months ago. And we're at this beautiful resort, and they have this pool, and it's one of these things where one side of the pool, right, it didn't just go straight to the deep end, right? It had this nice little ramp, right, where you would kind of like walk down, it would get deeper and deeper, had the little handrail. That's your job, is you need to establish that for your readers so that this way they have a very comfortable kind of descent into the deep end, right? The first paragraph of the personal statement should be your opportunity for them to be able to get to know you as a human being. Before you talk about your academic performance, before you talk about your research experience, your clinical experience in a narrative fashion, before you talk about your goodness of fit with the program and so forth, they need to know who you are. Okay, it's almost like creating a little Harry Potter in their head in terms of, you know, when you're reading one of those books, you got the character in your head, and then for the remainder of the book, 
you know who that person is or whatever, and now you're seeing them progress through things. This is the exact same thing with your personal statement. So that's number one, biggest mistake, jumping right into the deep end in terms of the first paragraph. Second thing is getting too personal, all right? In the behavioral health sciences, so again, things like psychology, psychiatry, nursing, social work, so forth, right? Um, sometimes there are different typologies of people who are applying, okay? But usually, particularly when it comes to mental health-related masters and doctorates, in some cases, we want to talk about a personal thing that happened in our life, okay? So this could be maybe you went through something like clinical depression or generalized anxiety. Uh, maybe, God forbid, a, a family member tragedy passed away due to suicide or even I had a case and was murdered oh my gosh I mean just really traumatic things happening maybe there was just a really awful assault that happened uh, earlier in your life or during college whatever it happens to be these things need to be handled very very carefully okay can you use those things as the reason why you're applying putting that in the personal statement yes but this is something where it needs to be handled with what they call kid gloves. In other words, very, very cautiously and very, very carefully. So this is one of the big reasons why this is oftentimes one of the things that I have to kind of assist on the most is figuring out how to help people word that personal thing that happened to them. Okay, because people largely do it incorrectly and in a way that is too personal. Okay. Uh, so this is something that, you know, really needs to be worked on. That's number two, is being too personal, sometimes too graphic, sometimes. Uh, sometimes you're just using mistake number three, which is too many adverbs or adjectives. Guys, academic writing, somebody asked me, you know, what my views on academic writing are. Like, how do you write in an academic fashion, for example, when you want to publish in a journal? Uh, and my semi-joking answer, even though I'm kind of serious, is that uh, essentially you take everything that makes reading enjoyable and you take it away, okay? So a big piece of this is adjectives and adverbs. And you have to be very, very careful about the verbiage that you're using in these personal statements, especially because people are really sensitive these days to things that could be like labeling language, okay? So for example, even things like, um, use a term like, um, uh, a substance abuser. No, this is an individual diagnosed with substance use disorder, with a substance use disorder, right? Uh, or it could be something like, uh, you know, schizophrenic patient. No, this is a patient diagnosed with schizophrenia. And this gets deeper and deeper depending on the field that you're in. For example, uh, I used to provide trainings for lots of, lots of different types of forensic mental health professionals. And one time I was giving a talk and there was a guy in the audience who was a uh, counselor, right? So clinical counselor counselor and he come up, came up to me afterwards he's like you know we don't use one of the terms you used anymore so so what's the term he said well you were talking about uh, assessing the likelihood of reoffense by juvenile sexual offenders i said yeah and so he's like no 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 we don't say jso anymore we don't say juvenile sex offender so i said interesting okay well what's the term and he said child or adolescent who's been convicted of perpetrating an act of sexual abuse and i was like whoa I would have no idea that that's the terminology that I should use, right? I, I would have no idea. So it's important whatever subfield you're interested in that you know the verbiage, you know kind of what people think is appropriate, what people do not think is appropriate, and so forth. There's a lot of those terms. But when it comes to adjectives and adverbs, though, okay, in addition to that kind of jargon that I just mentioned, you cannot use terms like really, extremely, very, no, right? None of those terms. And those are just three examples. Oftentimes, right? Things are referred to in uh, subjective language, suffering from mental illness, uh, this tragic bup, 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 okay? Uh, and these are terms where largely we cannot include them, right? Anything that has that kind of subjective or what my grad supervisor would have called emotional language, we have to take it out. Okay, uh, there are other ways to be persuasive uh, that do not involve using that kind of language. It is a big error, especially if you're applying for a program where any kind of research writing is necessary. You need to show that you've got chops in that area. In other words, you've got skill in that area. And this is something that is not going to make you look good, I guarantee it, okay, in terms of using certain types of terminology. Again, guys, this is why you need somebody external to, to read your stuff to be able to point out anything like this, any of these little errors, okay? 
Um, next one is saying anything along the lines in the behavioral health sciences of, I want to help people. This could come in any way, shape, or form, okay? I want to dedicate my life to serving my community, right? Even something like that, right? Um, no, we, we just can't say it. Why? Because I hope you want to help people and you love people and you're compassionate, you're empathetic. I hope you are because you're applying to one of these programs, right? But the problem is, so is every other applicant. There's no person who's applying to a clinical psychology doctoral program who's like, you know what? Screw people. I don't want to help anybody, <laughs> right? Nobody's doing that. And, and if you know anybody like that, let me know so we can get them out of the field, right? Uh, but it's, it's just one of these situations where uh, it comes across as being hyperbolic, uh, in other words, like over the top. It comes across as being saccharine and sappy and fake. And really what it comes across as is somebody who honestly does not understand the realities of being a clinician, okay? Um, so it just comes across as naive. That's, uh, that's the honest truth about it that nobody will tell you, right? So we want to avoid any statements like that, okay? Um, and last but not least is not clearly specifying the demographic and clinical groups of interest, right? If you watch other videos on the channel, you know that it, to get into grad school, you need to be really, really specific about the population that you want to work with or that you want to research, the clinical phenomenon that you want to focus on, really high specificity on that. Uh, and then also the method that you're interested in employing to be able to investigate uh, within that population, that clinical phenomenon, okay? Those things need to be really specific. No, you cannot say that your interest in working with Dr. Joe Hansen as your target supervisor is because he's interested in obsessive convulsive disorder phenomena, and I'm interested in that too. No, this is way too oversensitive, right? I, another big error is just saying that, oh, well, I'm interested in these three faculty members. I like this guy's work on this, and this guy's work on this, and this guy's work on this. No, right? One person, not two people, not three people. If they say you need to mention at least two, you write a bunch on one person, and then you have one one-off sentence where you're like, I'm also interested in Dr. Johnson's work on this. Why? Because Dr. Johnson is never going to accept you as a student. He or she is never going to accept you as a student, right? Because it's got this little blurb. But that's okay. We don't want that person to be the target supervisor. We want to use the words we have to focus on the number one person that we want to work with there. And if there's nobody there, you shouldn't be applying to that program in the first place. It doesn't matter how what the reputation of the program is or the name of the school. If there is no good target supervisor, you're going to spend four to six years, maybe even longer, depending on the program of your life. Well, this is for a doctorate, right? Master's less time, obviously, right? Uh, but, oh my gosh, it's going to be a freaking nightmare for you. I'm t grad school is already stressful enough, right? You don't need that added stress of having a supervisor where you're not interested in that work, right? It's just not a good idea, okay? The last thing that I have written down here is not getting specific about why a program is the right one for you. Again, this is a huge mistake people usually make. Those of you who've worked with me know that I have a very specific five-paragraph structure that I recommend to you guys and that I go through with you in meetings. I have you guys either make modifications to your personal statement or we go through it together or whatever and just you know point things out where we need to make modifications so you guys can make them so that we can finalize it. Uh, usually it ends up taking between one to three sessions to be able to get through the whole thing, right? That's just the average. Sometimes it takes fewer. Uh, sometimes it literally just only takes the one, right? Depends on what's going on with your personal statement. Uh, or these days, oftentimes it's not just one personal statement. We got a whole bunch of statements to go through, okay? Uh, but it's really important that you tailor every personal statement to every program. This is why you don't do something silly like applying to 10 to 15 programs, which is not a good idea. People think this is a good idea. It's a terrible idea, right? You will not have the time and energy to be able to do a deep enough dive into the work being done by the target supervisors and just the work in general that's being done at the university for you to be able to establish that you are, like, again, this ideal fit for that program. You just won't be able to do it. Nobody can do it. I can't do it either, right? It's just not possible. You need to pick three to five strong programs you need to spend at least one calendar year, I'm telling you, establishing a personal relationship, not just sending emails, okay, uh, with the target supervisor, okay? You need to see them in person if possible. I know with COVID that was hard, right? But you need to see these people, go to conferences, visit the university, not because a site visit matters at all. It doesn't do anything, but it gives you a chance to be able to sit down in person with that individual, okay? So these are my recommendations. I've got so much to say about personal statements. It is 
a really a joy for me to be able to work with you guys on these things to be able to help you out and again if you're interested in me taking a look at your stuff uh right now in terms of the current cycle uh, we got a few weeks left here uh for you guys to be able to get in touch with me these days guys i'm moving to barcelona here in a couple of weeks and so because of that make sure that uh that you get in touch asap so that we can get something on the books uh my website again is down here that said if you need a different day uh i don't do morning appointments but i do afternoon or evening appointments uh, i'm in the east coast on united in the united states you guys can get in touch with me happy to help all right guys god bless you looking forward to seeing you in the next one peace